Knock, knock. Who's there? Maybe a federal employee urging you to get a COVID vaccine if you haven't already. Sadly, you lost half the country at federal. And that's no joke. Tonight on Banfield, getting shots in arms while trying not to step on toes. And later, you know the face, you know the tattoos, and you know the hundreds of mean guys he's played. But tonight, you'll see the sweeter side of Danny Trejo, most people don't know about, including his wildly popular taco joint, tonight on Banfield. Hello and welcome to Banfield, in a country where we couldn't even agree on masks. It may be too much to ask for government employees to mount a door-to-door -door campaign for vaccination awareness without getting doors slammed in their faces. But that is what the Biden administration is attempting. Not syringe-wielding vaccination enforcers, not invaders of medical privacy, or any other privacy for that matter, just neighborhood canvassers sent into areas where vaccination rates lag where they should be. And the pushback is already fierce. Texas GOP Congressman Dan Crenshaw tweets, how about don't knock on my door? You are not my parents, you're the government. Make the vaccine available and let people be free to choose. Why is that concept so hard for the left? And thus, the least political subject on the planet Science remains just as political as ever in this country anyway. My first guest tonight is a scientist. Dr. Syra Madad is an infectious disease epidemiologist and part of the COVID-19 task force at the Federation of American Scientists. Welcome, Syra. It's good of you to join me. So why do you suppose there, this has become a thing where people are frustrated and angry at the latest effort to get the vaccination rates up, uh, door knocking? Well, I, I think many may see it as an inconvenience that they're getting a knock on their door and somebody asking if they have questions about the COVID-19 vaccine and maybe even offering the vaccine through the mobile clinics that are being you know, mobilized throughout the United States now. But this is certainly an effort to protect them. And so it's making sure that people understand that this is for their safety. It's the safety of those around them in the community. Because if we're looking at what's happening just here in the United States, we are starting to see an uptick in cases in over 20 states, the majority of them. You know, when you're looking at uh, data at the local level, you're seeing there are very large pockets of unvaccinated communities. In fact, we have over 1,000 counties in the United States that have a less than 30% vaccination rate. So we're very much vulnerable to uh, more localized uh, outbreaks, especially with highly transmissible variants like the Delta variant. So the latest effort to, through community engagement and through community-based efforts of door-to-door -door vaccination is a way to help vaccinate more people and to get their questions answered. So, you know, it all sounds uh, logical, but there are always the arguments that the government's the government and my body's my body. And boy, some of the uh, politicians have really taken up that, that banner. Let me read for you a couple of the political um, pushbacks to the Biden administration today. Missouri Governor Mike Parson, a Republican, uh, tweeted this, and I'll read verbatim. I have directed our health department to let the federal government know that sending government employees or agents door to door to compel vaccination would not be an effective or a welcome strategy in Missouri. Is anyone compelling people in this campaign? Like, is it one of those things where we're going to take your name and number if you don't get the needle? No, not at all. This is akin to contact tracing where we're having that. We continue to have that across the nation where your information is protected and that, you know, whether it's, you know, you're looking at your immigration status, whether you're looking at any other forms of information that's collected at the individual level, that is certainly kept confidential. Uh, but I think what's also important is the tactic, as you've mentioned, so it's not just about the federal employees going out. What they're also doing is they're highly, uh, they're, they're recruiting um, community members. They're recruiting what we call the public health corp, where millions of dollars are now being, you know, put in to establish this community of, 
you know, individuals that are trusted. So they may not be federal employees, they may not be public health officials, but there may be somebody that you recognize that, you know, have been uh, trained to talk about the COVID-19 vaccines that are coming to your doorsteps. So it's also about not just having the federal government at your doorstep, but having somebody that you recognize, that you trust as a trusted messenger, come and talk to you about why it's important to get vaccinated and address your questions. Yeah, I'm reading here that they've actually been doing it since April, so it's not all that new, but that they're using a lot of grassroots voices, local public health officials, and also um, uh, volunteers. So let me also read for you what the uh, Arizona Attorney General um, wrote in a letter to President Biden. He was mad, uh, Mark Brnovich. He said, I, along with many Arizonans, was greatly alarmed by your White House indicating that it might be in possession of medical records revealing the contact information for Americans who have not been vaccinated. If this is the case, this is a severe breach of privacy and I will not tolerate such intrusions within Arizona. I wouldn't either. But as I understand, it, Sarah, that is absolutely not true, even a little bit. The government's not using any medical records at all. They're not going to unvaxxed people. So who are they going to and what are they doing? How are they targeting? So there's some really great data that is collected at the local level. And in fact, CDC continues to collect and there's multiple different sources. So first, when we look at vaccination data, there is registries of people that have gotten vaccinated and they're put, their information is in the registry that they've gotten one dose, two dose. So you're able to see if you have a million people in, in a particular county and only you know 500,000 have received vaccination and they're in the registry, you know that there's about half that population that remains unvaccinated. So you're going to have better targeted interventions, a hyper-local response at that level. And then they, they have other uh, resources, for example, the social vulnerability index. That's something that shows us the socioeconomic status of some of these uh, counties uh, and the, the people that, that live in it. And so you're able to leverage multiple different platforms, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily have your information, but just has a number of people that are either working or that have been vaccinated. And then you're able to provide a more hyper-local response. And that's exactly what's happening. So they're looking for the areas that are, you know, low in, in vaccination numbers and, and targeting that way, not specific households like you. I see you in there. OK, so here's the thing, no, though. Yeah. I, I have to be honest. There will be thousands of people who are watching this right now saying you two ladies on TV are crazy. You don't get it. The government shouldn't be coming to my door and talking about my medicine and my body. And I think many of them are worried that there's so much data collection and so many privacy issues today. This is not helping. How do you answer to that? I think it's an important question and I think it's a valid concern and this is something where we want to continue to address it at the highest level of the government and at the lowest level at the at the uh, at the local level. And so I think there's a few things. First, it's to ensure that people know that your privacy and your data is certainly still protected, it's confidential. It's not going to be used against you in a law enforcement type of manner or, you know, because of your immigration status. And then second, it's going to places that you trust. And that's exactly why for example, the Biden administration is saying you don't have to go to, for example, healthcare system to get vaccinated if you don't have trust in the healthcare system. Go to your local barber shop, and that's exactly what they're doing through these community-based approaches. They're having vaccination, you know, um, vaccines available at salons, at places that you work, places that you're familiar with, with people that you may know, and that's kind of the tactic that's being used so they can talk to you about your information is safe and this vaccine is safe. So, Dr. Madada, this is a great question for you, especially since you're actually wearing the white coat, <laughs> because there are a lot of studies out there that show a lot of Americans are really scared about um, this vaccine. And, and this is where I kind of digress, but they're scared about taking the vaccine under the emergency use authorization. And many of them would prefer to wait for the FDA to fully approve the vaccine before using it. I I'm not so sure everyone follows it that deeply. Sure, there will be some people out there like that. But then there's these viral campaigns with nurses like the lady in Ohio who stuck a magnet to, or a spoon to her neck and a paperclip or something and said, oh, they're injecting magnets into you. And you have to combat that garbage. And I'll, you know, look, I'm a news anchor, but I know uh, the sky is blue and, and you can't put magnets in a teensy tiny needle. Yeah, absolutely. So first, I think from a public health standpoint, this is not my first rodeo. I've responded to multiple different outbreaks from Ebola to Zika to measles. I mean, you name it. 
and the rise of misinformation or the contagion of misinformation that we often call it in public health is, is very much alive um, and is full speed ahead in this current pandemic. Unfortunately, it has taken over a lot of the good news and a lot of the, the true facts and the science and evidence-based information. So I think it's first making sure you know where you're getting your epidemic information and not listening to people that may have ulterior motives or, or not, they're not educated. And then doing your own research as well. You have multiple different studies out there from multiple different reputable sources that show you the safety and the effectiveness and the safety profiles of these vaccines. And if that's not enough, then look at real world um, rollout. You're seeing millions of Americans, for example, over 330 million Americans have gotten the COVID-19 vaccine. And that's just here in the U.S. You have millions of other people around the world that have gotten vaccinated. And we have the safety data. And as, you're, as you alluded to, these vaccines that we have here in the U.S. that are FDA authorized, they're still under the emergency authorization. Many are waiting for that full approval, and we're hearing that it will likely happen within this month. But it is high time that we get full approval for these vaccines so people feel comfortable that these are vaccines that they can, that they're safe, they're effective, and that they can take to protect themselves and those around them. I do think that, uh, you know, it's a lot also about the messaging. And so we need to make sure we get the messaging right at all levels, again, from local to, to national to international. And we need to combat this misinformation, disinformation that is purposely being spread out there to harm more people. All right, I've got 20 seconds left, but is there anything more that can be done? Literally, I've got 20 seconds left, uh, other than the door knocking. Yeah, well, I think there's two options everybody has. Either you can get naturally infected and kind of suffer the consequences of not just the acute infection but long COVID, or you can immunize through a vaccine and, and actually protect yourself. And so as the virus continues to circulate, you have these two options. And so you want to make sure you're protecting yourself through vaccination. Well, uh, it'll be interesting to see the reaction some of these people get, right? Uh, you, I, I'd be a little scared if I was one of those door knockers. But Dr. Madad, thank you very much for your information tonight. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And coming up next, one of the most recognizable faces in Hollywood, a guy who has more than 400 film credits to his name. But um, it's the things that he's doing behind the scenes that will probably surprise you, shock you. He's one of the meanest looking guys and maybe one of the nicest actual guys. Danny Trejo joining me next. most prolific actors in Hollywood with more than, oh, I don't know, 400 credits to his name. Many of them, the most intimidating, nasty, mean characters put on film. But despite that extraordinarily tough guy image, his friends all say the same thing. He's like a really nice guy. Oh, and P.S., a heck of a businessman. He has a brand new memoir out. It's called Trejo, My Life of Crime, Redemption, and Hollywood, and it is in stores now. Danny Trejo, I am so happy you're on the show. I've been a fan of yours, like, for forever, and I guess it makes sense because I think you've been in the movies now for decades and decades. Since 1985, that's when I started. So your, your career is just a little older than mine. And I would imagine that when you see people on the street, they probably all have the same thing to say. Like, are you as scary in real life? <laughs> you know, Eddie Bunker, the guy that actually got me into movies, who I've known since our days in San Quentin prison, he was the one that kind of said, you have to disarm people immediately. When somebody sees you, especially a guy, they always puff up, you know, and, and and he said, you have to like immediately say, hey, how you doing? You know, because. Well, because you look at every time you're in a movie, you're this scary guy. I think I uh, read in the book that you've been killed 65 times on uh, uh -huh. on film, right? Yeah, yeah, it's over 90 now. And uh, I've. Uh, oh. I have the record. I have the record. I've been killed more times than anybody. And everybody says, what do you think about that? I says, what are you talking about? The check cleared on all of them. <laughs> Which is a brilliant way of thinking about it. By the way, just look at the cover of your book. Like, you, you did the mean look for the cover, too. Do you ever give a look that's like the, the nice sweetheart that all your friends say you are? <laughs> when I'm with my kids. <laughs> 
<laughs> ah, well, that's good. I'm glad. Do they have have they ever been freaked out by the characters in your movies? The only time my daughter got freaked out was in Heat when I died in Heat. She couldn't look at that. That was that was. I think it was too real, and she knew I was. I, you know, I had that life, so it was a little scary for her. But other than that, God, when I died on. On uh, from dusk to dawn, and my eyes went in the pool table. She was like six, I think, and she just jumped up and screamed, "Oh, that was so cool!" <laughs> 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 Clearly, you 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 trained her well to be able to you know take that all in as just Hollywood magic. But you know what's amazing about you, Danny, is your story. I mean, yeah, you're a great actor. Everybody knows you. You're super famous. But you had a really, really tough go. I mean, you said in your book, I think it was like, I always figured I'd die in prison. So take me back to those days and how it all began. Well, you, you know, I had an uncle who was my role model. He, he was, I think he was the last of 11 children. And, uh, you know, I, if you have 11 kids, you're kind of burnt out. So, and uh, so my uncle was kind of left for his own devices. I was a single, uh, single kid. So uh, me and him kind of just grew together. And, and, and uh, he was more like a brother, like an older brother, but he was like a mentor, you know, and, and uh, he happened to be a drug addict and an armed robber. So. I kind of like followed in his footsteps, taught me everything I was supposed to know when I got to San Quentin. And uh, I I was kind of a, a well-known person within the Department of Corrections. So one of the stories that you tell um, about San Quentin is like <laughs> meeting Charles Manson and having these, these, you know, moments with him that were just I mean, for the rest of us out here, he's almost unbelievable as a character, right? But you actually, you met him, and I think you said something like he was he was wanting you to help uh, protect him in well, in prison. He wanted to clean your cell, or tell me a little bit about well, that. We weren't, it, you know, there was a, we was it was in the county jail in L.A. County Jail, and everybody had six or seven people in their cell that had to stay there. We there, we, there was only three of us, and because uh, we were kind of like the well-known guys. And so uh, uh, when Charlie came in, he, Charlie couldn't have done what he did any place else or, the, or that time. You, you know what I mean? He wasn't like the guy you saw on TV. He was like five foot five or five foot six. He was poor, had a little, had a string holding up his, his county pants because he didn't have a belt and uh, they were getting ready to abuse him. And we found out that he could hypnotize people. So I told him, get us loaded on weed. So he actually got us loaded on marijuana through hypnotism. And wow. I, oh, great. And then I said, okay, get me loaded on heroin. So he tried to, two of us got loaded on heroin. The other one guy didn't. And afterwards, Charlie asked him, did you ever use heroin? He said, no. He said, well, your mind doesn't know how to behave. I had used heroin. Chapter had used heroin, so, so we knew. And, uh, you know, so we wanted to keep him around, keep us loaded. And then after a while, they Oh, my Lord. Out. It's so bizarre to hear that uh, because the stories you hear about Charles Manson, you know, are blood curdling. And, you know, he is uh, to, to most of America, he is just nothing short of a monster. But he actually, yeah. as I understand it, helped you with guided meditation. No, just hypnotizing me to get loaded. Well, that was it. I, there was no. <laughs> yeah, no, you understand. You have to understand. I, Charlie couldn't have done that anyplace else. He found what five or six broken girls that were being abused in in uh, in uh, Oakland and San Francisco at at uh, Haight Ashbury and and my friend George Perry, who was from that area, knew him. You know, knew those girls and said they were just you know little hood rats and and just trying to live on the streets and stuff. And so when he came around with his bus and acid, uh, you know, it was like the Messiah. 
It's, it's amazing. Hey, um, we have to stop down for a break, but um, Danny, when we come back, I want to talk to you about uh, this iconic role, Machete, that you did in 2001. There's something I read in your book that just made me smile. It wasn't that you were going to be, you know, this, this fantastic Hispanic star. You were going to be Batman. I love it. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We are back with Danny Trejo, who's got this great book out. It is obviously the self-titled Trejo. And I'll tell you what, Danny, I, I want to ask you a little bit about Machete in a second, but not before I sort of dovetail off what you said before the break about, you know, going through the prison experience, because I know it's really changed how you look at the public policy of prison reform. What are your thoughts about it? Well, you know, I would say right now there's probably... 10% of the people that are in prison belong in prison and should, should maybe never get out. But there's a lot of people in prison that could have been handled in, in rehabs. In you know, I mean, I, I know kids that you know, went to the pen for cocaine possession and you know, three grams of cocaine and and they're doing five six years and yet the guy that busted with 40 kilos you know uh our system is broken in that sense and you know every time i went to juvenile hall i seen the majority of african american latino and 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 poor uh white kids you know you won't find it a rich white kid in juvenile hall and uh yeah. because they have the uh, ability in fact this kid back east had raped this girl and the judge said he has a a, a great future in front of him because he i guess he was in college and I thought, my God, if that would have been a Mexican or an African-American, they'd have buried him. And you look at our system, if that insurrection or whatever that, that insurgent was when they attacked the Capitol, you didn't see a lot of Mexican-American or African-American, you know, because uh, if that would have happened, I wonder what would have, if that would have been Black Lives Matter, I, I, I think they would have, the National Guard would have got there really quick. So it's interesting. Our... Some congressmen, Danny, have actually said that they would have been more afraid uh, if the, that had been a crowd um, from Black Lives Matter. And I think you were referring to Brock Turner, the Stanford. Um, they used to call him the Stanford rapist, but it was a sexual assault that he was convicted of, and he really, you know, skated on the long, the long jail time. You're right about that. Let me ask you about your other. Um, altruistic activism. I know that you, I think you were with Magic Johnson and Arsenio Hall getting your public COVID yeah. shots to try to encourage <laughs> the public. So yeah. let me ask you, because the numbers in the African-American, Black and Latino communities of people getting vaccinated really lag. What's, what's well, that, your message now, there? Now the Latin American community, we've been out on, you know, pounded on doors saying, come on, we got to get vaccinated. And you know, so, so they're going up. But some reason African American communities aren't, you know, aren't getting aren't getting vaccinated, and you know they don't trust. They're scared, and and uh, look at we were all standing up. I'm as tall as those guys, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so that I mean, I but think that's, that's a, you problem. know, it's it's important, right? Are you seeing like are you seeing any changes happening, or are you still frustrated with the uh, the pace of the COVID vaccinations well, in the I'm, Hispanic I'm, community? I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of changes. I know that a lot of people, and I ask, have you gotten vaccinated? I'm in. And it got the new pickup line is, hey, I'm vaccinated. Yeah, I mean, because literally everybody wants to know, you know, and, hey. <laughs> 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 okay, let me talk a little bit about Machete. It's one of my favorite images of you, the movie that you did that, you know, 2001 just catapulted you into stardom. And lo and behold, I found something in your book about it that I loved. It, it, and I'm going to read from, this is page 218. So, okay. To me, Machete wasn't about the first Mexican-American action star 
or the first studio movie where the romantic lead was 65 years old who looked like he'd seen a thousand miles of hard road. To me, being Machete meant I was going to be Batman. Tell me about yeah. that. Tell me about writing it. It was, it was, it was like the, the biggest thrill I ever got was well, the Halloween after Machete. And there's a knock on my door. The kids are trick-or-treating. And they got these four little kids, five, six, seven years old. And they're standing there. And they are they got their little painted mustache on. And I go, who are you? They were Machete. You know, they, it was like I almost started crying. Just like, wow, it's not Batman. It's not Superman. It's not, you know, it's, it's like these kids are like, you know, being proud of this this character and and so right now still it's still being shown and spy kids the same thing i've seen look mama it's uncle machete they call me uncle because in 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 in, uh, in spy kids i was uncle machete right Right. So listen, there's another whole side of you that people might know about or not know about. And it's your amazing business prowess. The last I count, you had um, eight taco restaurants called uh, Trejo's Tacos. You have a donut joint. You got a line of coffee, a line of beer. Anthony Bourdain was a huge fan of yours. Then you just told me before we came on television that you have Trejo's Cantina and then a record label, Trejo's Music, how do you hey. do all your, <laughs> like, of course you have it there. <laughs> how do you find time to go on uh, TV hey. and movies? They told me a lot, a long time ago, a businessman has time to do everything, you know, and uh, and I'm not the kind of businessman that's at dinner with on the phone. I'm not that kind of guy. It's like, uh, uh, if I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you, I'm not on the phone. And I, I hate that when, when people are carrying a conversation and trying to, talk on the phone but everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else and i got into the restaurant business because i did a favor for a uh a director named craig moss who had a a movie called badass that he wanted to do and it was a low budget movie and i was going for this uh kind of a bigger budget movie, but my agent, Gloria Hosa, kept kind of saying, you know, this might turn into something, Danny. We might want to do this, but I, I was going for the money on this other one, and finally, she did that 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 lady, I'm disgusted with you thing. You know, that, okay, well, do whatever you want. I don't care. Go ahead. <laughs> now, I've only been in the business this long, but you know better. So, I said, okay, all right, I got you. So we did Badass, turned into a trilogy, did four times the amount of money, but I met a, a producer, no, a producer named Ash Shaw, who saw that I like good food, I don't eat processed food, I eat, I eat good, and he said, Danny, why don't you open a restaurant? Jokingly, I said, Trejo's Tacos. And then I love it. Oh, you know what? When I come out to LA next, we are going to sit down over one of your beers and some of those Trejo's tacos. And I hope uh, I hope it's sooner rather than later. What a treat to talk to you, Danny. Thank you so much. I've got a single record dropping right now with Trish Toledo and Coda the Barber, and that's all. Uh, <laughs> okay. Music. Then, then when we go to Trejo's Tacos together, we will dance to your single as well. Thank you, Danny Darn. Trejo. And by the way, good luck with the book, My Life of Thank Crime, you. Redemption, and Hollywood. Danny Trejo, everybody. Thanks, Danny. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you right back. And still to come, it's hard to believe this, but this week marks 10 years since the shocking verdict in the Casey Anthony trial. And we have an update on what's happening with her now. Kaylee Anthony believe it or not, would have been turning 16 years old this summer, maybe learning to drive or maybe sharing her first kiss. But tragically, that is not the case. Her killer has never been brought to justice. Her mother, Casey, however, is a free woman, having been found not guilty of her daughter's murder 10 years ago this week. State of Florida versus Casey Marie Anthony. As to case number 2008, CF15606-0. As to the charge of first-degree murder, 
Verdict as to count one. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty, so say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this 5th day of July, 2011, signed for person. And that is how that ended. Here to help us take a look back on that moment and that trial that gripped the nation is the judge who presided over it, Judge Belvin Perry, also formerly chief judge in the Florida Ninth Judicial Circuit. Joining us also, legal analyst and former prosecutor Beth Karras. She's also the host of Oxygen's Snapped, Notorious, and um, also covered that case along with me. It's good to see the both of you. Um, thank you for joining me on this. Judge Perry, I, I would like to just... First of all, ruminate on the fact it's been 10 years and you don't age. Um, and, and secondly, I want to ask you, in those 10 years, Judge, what keeps you up at night? The simple fact of what really happened, what happened to that young girl, how did she die, why did she die? And until we get answers to that question, uh, we will always wonder. Do you think you know? Uh, no. I, I mean, you can look at the evidence. You, you can surmise what happened, uh, that she was possibly uh, suffocated, whether it was intentionally done to suffocate her or whether it was accidental suffocation. But uh, only the person that was present at that moment really knows the answer. Do you think it was Casey? She knows the answer to the question. Now, whether or not it was her, I I'm not going to speculate on that, but she was the last person to be seen alive with her daughter. So she has to know the answer. Judge, would it be difficult for you to make the leap that so many Americans and indeed people around the world um, have made by saying that they believe she's the killer? I, I don't think it would be difficult, but uh, remember, and one of the things I still hold to to this day is uh, uh, judges are not supposed to have beliefs in cases that they presided over. And the verdict speaks the truth uh, as to what those jurors thought at that time. So uh, what I believe or don't believe really doesn't matter. So I'll bring Beth Karras in, into that conversation um, because Beth, it's the journalist, uh, you know, principle is to also not have a, a feeling one way or the other, or at least show it. But that brought out, um, that brought out a lot of feelings for, for people who spent months in that courtroom, like you and me. What were your thoughts? First of all, when the verdict was read, the not guilty verdicts in those first counts, uh, it really took the wind out of me. I mean, I had to sit back in, in my seat and sort of take it in because I really thought that she was going to be found guilty of some level of homicide, a lesser, the aggravated manslaughter she was charged with, or a child neglect. I mean, at a minimum, child neglect. She's only convicted of four misdemeanors. I didn't understand why this mother, who didn't report her child missing for 31 days, didn't at least in the jury's mind be found guilty of neglect. I agree with Judge Perry. We don't really, we never know exactly what happened and that Casey is the person who knows whether she did it or not. She's the one who knows. And I could tell you one thing, the evidence in my opinion does not support that she drowned accidentally in the family pool, which was what the defense put forth at the beginning in their opening statement. So I agree with you, Beth. I believe that the evidence that, you know, the defense brought in court does not support their theory, but that's not their job. They're not supposed to give you, um, you know, an, an innocence case. They don't even have to present one if they don't want to. But the evidence, I have to say, and you're a former prosecutor, you're perfect for this. I don't believe the evidence that the prosecution brought supported their story of her being this maniacal killer that pinned down her daughter and put tape over her nose and mouth and watched her breathe her last breath. And there was nothing to show that that happened, whether you think it did or not. What they well, brought that jury didn't show that. Okay, so it might have been overreaching for the prosecution to charge 
this as a capital case, to seek the death penalty. You may recall that they were not seeking death before the body was found. And once the body, you know, they had charged her with murder before there was a body. Once Kaylee's remains were found, I'll never forget the day I was there in Orlando, December 11th, 2008, that, that changed circumstance caused the prosecution to revisit the case and then they decided to seek death. So maybe in hindsight, mm, that was a, a little too much because it just made it that much more difficult for them. They had to prove that, you know, that she intentionally killed her daughter and that it was capital murder, that she deserved to die for it. When maybe, I, as Judge Kelly suggests, it was accidental uh, taping of her just to shut her up, you know? Kay Kaylee was getting vocal. She was gonna be able to start expressing herself. And maybe Kaylee didn't want her talking. Or maybe that tape was put over her face after an accidental car overheated with her in the back because that car of Casey's was a beater in the Florida June weather. And, you know, she had a penchant for saying something about Zanny, known by many as Xanax, and did like to visit her boyfriend. And, got, I mean, this is one of my theories. It wouldn't be crazy to suggest she said, Kaylee, sleep in the car, here's some help, and I'm gonna go upstairs, and then the air conditioning quit because the car quit. And within an hour, that could have been the end of it. Let, Judge Perry, let me ask you a little bit about what Beth just said. Um, and I'm gonna let you think about this over the break. You are the person who was the, the, the guide, the, 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 the father of the juror experience. The jurors depended on you every day. You were their only person to help guide them through this process, and you had their ear and they had yours. I want to ask you a little bit about your feelings regarding their experience, what they learned, what they maybe did not learn, especially as was evidenced when they gave their verdict. When we come back, I want to get your feelings on that. We're going to go into a little bit about what Casey has done lately, just making the news in the last few weeks. We're back in a moment. I know one thing, as the defense sits by and has their champagne toast after that not guilty verdict, somewhere out there, the devil is dancing tonight. Became a famous line uh, for Nancy Grace as she covered uh, the verdict and indeed the entire case involving Casey Anthony. Back with me now, pivotal uh, figures in the case, Judge Belvin Perry, who presided over that case, Beth Karras, journalist who covered that case and many more. And joining the conversation is Aphrodite Jones. She's an investigative reporter and host of True Crime with Aphrodite Jones on Investigation Discovery. Also spent many, many weeks on end with me in the courtroom. Aphrodite, thank you for joining the conversation. Um, I want to start just uh, by, by completing the conversation from before the break, uh, Judge, and, and that was just about the notion that, that Casey Anthony um, had jurors that did not believe what the prosecution wanted them to believe. And some of them did interviews, but you had an intimate experience with them in being their guide every day in that courtroom. Give me your thoughts about the juror experience and, and how they digested that case. Number one, there were a number of unanswered questions that you can tell that that jury had. One of the jurors indicated uh, that uh, she felt uh, that uh, the state did not prove its case because they could not prove how uh, Kelly died. Uh, prosecution should have spent some time in that particular case explaining to them that that was not an element to be proven in that case. And they should have asked for a uh, special jury instruction, which they did not. The second point is uh, we had a lot of talk about uh, chloroform, uh, but we never heard any testimony as to the ways that chloroform was used uh, to render someone unconscious. Uh, another area was George Anthony. He, anyone in that trial knew that most of those jurors uh, was not going to believe George, that the finger would be pointed at him. Uh, but the prosecution, maybe they could have, maybe they could not, should have had someone to come in and buttress George's testimony that he was at work. 
that would eliminate the notion that he came back home and helped uh, dispose of the body. So Aphrodite, jump into the conversation, um, specifically here. Ten years this week since that verdict, and everybody gasped, you included. And yet, there's yeah, been well, no major sit-down. <laughs> we could hear each other. I think we were right next to each other. Right. Um, but there's, we were. there's been no major we sit-down interview with Casey, and I don't know, over the 33 years that I've been doing this work, and, and over the many years you have as well, You've always had that moment where they sit down and talk, but she has not, which has left the enigma alive. Why do you think she hasn't? Well, what could she possibly have to gain by talking, Ashley? She has, in effect, gotten away with murder. And the minute she opens her mouth, she will become another OJ. Not that she already isn't, but something will snaggle her into, you know, perhaps uh, she can't be tried again for murder, but th there'll be something else to crash in her world. Uh, as it stands, she's a pariah, she's, but she's got a life, whatever that may be. Um, she's free. She's not behind bars. I mean, she, Ashley, she sat, we know this, she sat behind bars for over two years waiting for a trial, confusing everyone with her you know, stories and lies and whatever. And at the end, she gets convicted of giving false information to the police. That's it. I mean, it's a tr it was a triumph for her and for her lawyer, who frankly won this uh, as an underdog, I think, this was Jeff Ashton's case to lose, and I, I agree with Judge Perry that Je uh, Jeff Ashton just didn't do enough to yeah. uh, knock out reasonable doubt in the jury's mind. Beth, I, Beth, I only have about 30 seconds left, but I, I just want to get your thoughts on, on how that changed um, you know, defense lawyers across the country as they enter into their cases. What, what impact did that case have on American jurisprudence? I talked to some of the best defense attorneys in the country who really applauded Jose Baez, who I thought r didn't really understand the rules of evidence all that well, but was really good in front of a jury, like talking to the jury. It annoyed mm -hmm. me to no end that he was able to open on Casey's supposed sex abuse by her father when she was a child. And of course, I thought Casey was going to testify because there's no other way that, that George George's testimony could be refuted except by Casey. Right. And that didn't happen. And of course, Judge Perry, you know, forbade the defense from summing up on that because they didn't enter any proof into it. But they dirtied the case up with unprovable allegations right from the opening statement. That to me was disingenuous. But the law allows the defense to do that. It's dirty playing, in my opinion, but they were allowed to do it. And it poisoned the jury. I feel like I feel like if anybody learned anything, uh, you know, lay people and lawyers alike, it's uh, anything's possible, you know, in a, in a courtroom. I wish we could speak on this further, but Judge Perry, Beth Karras, Aphrodite Jones, thank you so much for taking the time to revisit this story um, and for giving your expertise. We appreciate it. And thank you all for watching tonight. Have a wonderful evening.